Jesus, thank you for who you are. God, we ask this morning that you would come and be here um, with us. God, we, we need you desperately this morning because if we're just gathering and singing and hearing some ideas, then God, we're wasting our time. So we ask that you would come meet us here. Um, Lord, speak t- through me um, to the hearts of, of your people. And we thank you in advance that you'll do that. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, last week, Casey started us off on this new series called Connected. And, and we're kind of looking at what is the idea, like if, if all of life was connected to Jesus, what, is that, what does that look like? Because if Jesus is who he says he is, if Jesus is the, the king of the universe who came down and died on a cross and rose again and he offers us life with him, like if that's who Jesus is, then that probably shouldn't just change like our Sunday morning routine. Uh, it probably shouldn't just change like our, our faith or our belief system. But if that's who Jesus is, then it should probably change everything in our life as a result. And so that's what we're going to look at. And so um, throughout this series, we've been looking at some Old Testament passages, passages that come kind of before Jesus came and what God's doing in his people. And and we're going through this series at the same time as Avenue Kids is going through the same passages. And so the hope is that if you have kids and Avenue Kids, that you can connect with them after the service and begin to teach them, begin to instruct them, and show them how all of life points to Jesus. How even, even like in the Old Testament, before Jesus came, it was still all about Jesus. Because God does something cool throughout his, his word, um, even from the beginning of creation, we know the whole story, right? We, we, on this side, we know the gospel. And so we can go back and look and see how even in the Old Testament, like, God is bringing his people to himself. He's preparing them um, for Jesus. And so last week, the passage that Casey looked at was Saul. And he talked about how Saul had a disease. Do you guys remember what disease he had? I got it. He said, I got this. IGT. Paul, or Saul had IGT, because it seems like whatever kind of situation that came up in Saul's life, his heart kind of said towards God, hey, I, I got this. Like, I, I, don't, I don't really need you in this moment, God. I can do it on my own. God, you want me to wait? I, no, I got this. I'm actually going to go. Or God, you want me to go left? No, I got this. I can do it on my own. I'm going to go right. And so we saw how, like, how that ended up for Saul. It doesn't end up good, because when we, when we reject God, when we tell God, hey, I got this. I got this on my own. It doesn't work out well. Because that's not what the gospel says, right? The gospel says, Lord, I, I don't have this. I need, I need saving. He talked about putting a hand up, like for a cab, like, hey, help me. Help me. I need help. That's what the gospel says. Um, and so if, if last week kind of the, the main takeaway was this, like God's people wanted a king and they got Saul, but it, it didn't really work out. Saul wasn't really a good king. And so actually what God was doing in the bigger story is he was telling his people, there's a better king that's coming than Saul. You need to be ready for a better king who's coming in Christ. And we can see that as we look back and can kind of know what's coming, we can pick up on that. And like I said, God does that all throughout the Old Testament. We're going to look at a a different passage where the same thing happens. He's preparing his people for Jesus because all throughout the Old Testament, they're looking forward to Jesus. In our life, and as we read the New Testament, like we look back to Jesus, but everybody's looking to Jesus. That's kind of the point. And so when I, when I think about like, okay, God's, God's writing this big story. He's telling this big story. Um, and, and then he does it in a way that's through these smaller stories. My mind immediately goes to Star Wars. <laughs> it does. It goes, I, got, I love Star Wars. I love Star Wars when I was growing up. Um, I was like, I had the t-shirt, I would play games with my cousins. I was like the chubby kid running around with a lightsaber, like trying to use the force and all this stuff. Uh, my, my dad, we used to go to the, I used to go to the hardware store a lot with my dad, and they had these little uh, black magnets that would sit in this box uh, by the checkout counter, and I'd always kind of play with them. I don't, know, I don't know why they were there, I don't know what their purpose is, but they're fun to play with. <laughs> so I, I would play with these magnets, and this one time my dad, we bought it, we bought two of them, and I figured out when I got home that I could put, I could take one magnet and put it underneath the table and put the other one on top. 
and then like they were still connected because they were pretty powerful. And so I'd, I'd like sit there, and my sister would come in, and I'd be like, using the force, like, <laughs> like this is amazing. I'm a Jedi master. Like I, I love Star Wars, uh, probably too much. But Star Wars is told like one big story, right? There's there's eight main movies, and they've made some some offshoot movies like Han Solo and uh, what's the other Rogue One, like. So they, they've had these, off, these offshoot movies, but it's all told in one big story throughout eight movies. And, and there's just, like, something about those eight movies and the way they're connected that, like, I can just sit and watch Star Wars, like, until my eyes bleed and love every second of it. I'll, like, post up with my favorite snack. Like, everybody's got their, their go-to kind of movie snack or, or Netflix snack. I don't know if you guys have had the the peanut butter pretzels from Trader Joe's. Oh my gosh. I will destroy an entire bag of peanut butter pretzels uh, watching Star Wars. Uh, but, but like there's something about seeing a, a bigger picture and then like seeing how it plays out in these smaller segments. But here's the deal. Like you, you can, if you've never watched Star Wars before, you can sit down and watch one episode and like it's good. It's a, it's a good movie. There's a beginning, middle, and end and there's uh, you know, a plot line, like in itself, it's a, it's a whole movie. And that's great. It's really great, actually. I love them. <laughs> but, it, but you don't really appreciate all that's happening in Star Wars, or you can't really f- totally appreciate that movie, that episode, unless you see it in, like, the bigger picture and, and what's happening in the greater story. And you can walk back and be like, oh, like, that leads to, that's going to be Anakin. He's going to be Darth Vader. And you can kind of, like, pick out what's coming through that. And so as we talk about, like, God's story, God's bigger story, the, the greater story that God is writing, this morning we're going we're gonna to zoom in kind of on, on one episode. We're gonna, but we have to look at it in terms of what's happening in the larger story. But there's a, there's a big difference in Star Wars and God's story. There's probably more than one. But, but one, one that we're going to look at is, like, we're never, I'm never invited into the Star Wars narrative into the movie. Like, I would love that, but I'm not. Like, I'm I'm separate from that. I'm not invited into that ever. But when we talk about God's story, the narrative that that God has been writing from creation to now, like, he's made you to play a role in that. We're actually invited in to that story. And so that's what we're going to look at today. And so this week, we're we're zooming in on a particular episode, and that's, it's going to be David and Goliath, which is like, one of the most famous passages probably in all of Scripture. Even if you're not a Christian, you've probably heard like David and Goliath, little guy, big guy kind of thing. But in order to do that, we've got to kind of place it in God's bigger story. So in God's story, you've got four chapters, creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. So what happens at creation is God creates the world and it's perfect and everything is good. And there's unity with God, like humans are walking and talking and connected to God. And then at the fall, sin enters the world. And that sin, like, brings brokenness in a lot of ways. But the worst part of sin is that it it separates us from God. Like, that that unity that was there is no longer there. And then we can see later in the story, like, redemption comes. And and what Jesus does redeems that sin and that brokenness. And then the final chapter of God's story, like, everything is going to be, God's going to unite everything just like the way it was in creation. And so as we pick up David and Goliath, uh, this, is, this happens after the fall, but before Jesus. So they're still looking forward to Jesus, their sin and brokenness, and that redemption chapter, like, hasn't quite happened yet. And last week we talked, you know, God's people wanted a king. They wanted to be just like the other nations, and so, so they got Saul, but it didn't really work out. Um, and so as we pick up today, Saul is still the king of Israel. And, and he's still like the commander of the army, but he, he's kind of on the way out. Like things aren't going well for Saul. And we're going to be introduced to David as a young boy, and he ends up becoming the next king of Israel. But I'll just, I'll just be honest. Like if, if, I were, if I were you, and I was sitting out there, and... At this point of this message, there's a good chance I might start to check out because I'm like, who is, who is this kid? Like, he looks like he's 17. Why is he teaching me? Um, and he's talking about Star Wars, and he's about to teach me about David and Goliath. Like, I'm good. <laughs> like, 
what's for lunch, I'm going to check my fantasy team. Like, there's a good chance that's how my mind would go because we know the story, right? We know David and Goliath. But here, here's the way that David and Goliath is usually played out, usually interpreted. It's something like, okay, you've got like a big bad Goliath. But then David comes in and he's got awesome faith. And he's able to take down Goliath because he trusts that God's bigger than his problems. And so you should trust that God's bigger than your problems. And you should have great faith and you should be just like David. And that's true. Like there's, 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 there's truth there. Totally. Should you, should you believe that God's bigger than your problems? Yes. Uh, should you have faith and, and like step out when times are difficult? Yes. But I think if, if that's our take on David and Goliath... That, that's kind of like watching one episode of Star Wars. Like, if that's all we had, then that's great. Yeah, be like David. But since we know God's greater story, since we know God's greater story, I think that God actually is doing a lot more in the narrative of David and Goliath than just telling you to be like David. I think he's doing a lot more. I think he's actually painting like a, a beautiful gospel picture that's going to point his people to the Redeemer, just like he did with Saul. And so that's what um, we're going to look at today. And like keeping in mind that this is not a book study, this is not theoretical, like we are invited into what God is doing. And so when we look at David and Goliath today, we're going to learn something, I think, about our role in what God is doing. So we pick up, uh, we pick up the story in 1 Samuel 17. And, and like I said, we kind of know it, but, but here's what happens. You've got God's people. They're the Israelites. Okay? And then you've got the enemies of God, who are the Philistines. And they're at war with each other, and they're kind of advancing. The two armies are advancing towards one another, but then they get stalled out. Like they stop, because one's on a mountain over here, the other one's coming around a mountain over here, and there's this place that's this big valley in between. And so the armies stop, because if one of them advances then you would be like going down into the valley to approach your enemy like when they have the high ground. And that's not, that's not what you want in war. I can't tell you that from a lot of war experience, but I can tell you that from a lot of paintball experience. Because part of working with students is like every year you get to go shoot high school kids with a paintball gun for Jesus. Like it's amazing. It's the best part of student ministry. And so I've had the high ground. Like I've been in the fort just lighting those punks up for Jesus. Um, and that, like, that's, that's, you want the high ground. So, like, neither one, neither one of them wants to advance toward the other one in the valley. And so, you know the story, right? The Philistines send out their champion. They send out Goliath. And the scripture goes into, like, this long account of how, how huge he is. And his, he's, like, nine and a half feet tall. And he's got a spear and this shield and this armor. He's this great warrior. Like, been a warrior his whole life. And he, he walks out into that valley, and he issues a challenge to God's people. He says, look, we're, we're stalled out here, but let's, let's do this. Let's, you send your best champion to come fight me, and we'll do this thing one-on-one, -on -one and, and we'll respect the results. Like, the whole army will respect the results. If I win, you become our slaves. If you win, we'll become your slaves. And so the Israelites, like, see this dude walk out into the valley, and he's massive and they ha they have like no no way to go and fight him not one person can go and fight them and so they're filled they're filled with fear they're filled with fear but in comes david uh, and he he's a shepherd boy he's an israelite but he's not in the army his three older brothers are in the army and so his dad sends him to go check on his brothers and i was <laughs> i was getting ready for this message and i was reading through this at starbucks uh, and I just, I laughed to myself like a weirdo because it says that, and this is a horrible interpretation of scripture, but it made me laugh. It says that he like, he sends him with cheese to his brothers. And I'm like, I guess that's what he thought he needed. Like, hey guys, how's the war? Here's a cheese plate. Like, I hope this helps, you know. <laughs> uh, maybe there's some like deep spiritual significance to the cheese plate. I just made me laugh in Starbucks. Uh, but he, come, he comes to like check on his brothers, and, but he quickly like sees the, sees the situation for what's going on. And he says, how, do you, how are we trembling in fear? Don't you know who we are? Like, God's on our side. And so you know the story. David walks out into the valley. And he, he takes five stones and he slings one of them with a slingshot, hits Goliath in the forehead, and he drops. 
And then he runs over, he cuts off Goliath's head with his own, with Goliath's sword. And the Philistines flee. Like they, they want no part of whatever God can do what they just saw. And so they turn around and they flee and the Israelites pursue them after what just happened. And so here's what we do with David and Goliath. Like I said, we, we hear that and we're like, man, that's a good story. Like, I, I like that. Well, that should be a movie. If I was there, like, I hope I would have been like David. I think I would have. Like, how do they not have faith? Don't they know who God is? And we, like, put ourselves in the, in the dead center of this story. Because we like to do that. We like to be the main character. But here's kind of the point today. We like to put ourselves as the main character in this story. But I don't think that the gospel puts us there. I don't think that our role in this story is David, or, or you should be more like David. There's some truth to that, but we're going we're gonna to kind of go back and unpack this passage, looking at David as a Christ figure. Like, what if David's role in this story was just to teach the Israelites about a better Savior who was coming? And if David's the Savior figure, if David's the Christ figure, well, then who does that make me? And who does that make you? Like, what should we do with that? And so here's the first point we're going to look at. Number one, David rescues the Israelites from an unwinnable battle. Chapter 17, verse 11 says this. When Saul, this is after Goliath comes out and he presents this challenge to the Israelites. When Saul and all of Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. And so I, I, think, I think that's important. I think it's important. And I want to camp out there because, like I said, the danger with kind of teaching on a, a popular story that a lot of people probably know is we can read through it because we know the ending. But, like, put yourself in the, in the shoes of a Philistine or in a, of an Israelite for just a second. Like, you're, you're there ready for battle. You're standing with your army. And this dude comes out and you are horrified. And the scripture says that this... That goes on for 40 days. I don't, I don't think we talk about that like when we tell the Sunday school version, but Goliath comes out morning and evening for 40 days. That's a really long time. And the, and the Israelites are horrified and they have no plan. Like if there would have been maybe one guy in Israel who maybe had a chance, like in 40 days they would have sent him out. Or if, like, Saul could have got together with the generals and been like, hey, all right, we got to come up with a strategy. Like, this is the situation we're facing. This is an army. And for 40 days, they have no plan. And their only response is fear. Their only response is fear. And so if we kind of, like, if we're zoomed in on this episode of David and Goliath, let's zoom back out to God's bigger picture. Let's zoom out to the gospel. Like, the Bible says that if, if we place ourselves in the role of the Israelites for a second, the Bible says that every single one of us is a sinner. Sin is, sin is anything that like goes against God. And the Bible says that I'm, I am born a sinner, like inside of me. It's like a disease that I'm born with. And not, not only am I born with this disease, but I actually continue to choose sin. We all continue to choose sin over and over and over. And what sin does, like we saw in the fall, like sin separates us from God because God is holy. And so if I'm a sinner with sin inside of me and sin on me, I cannot be in the presence of a holy and righteous God. I can't. And so the Bible says that the penalty for sin, like if you're a sinner, and you are, <laughs> like if you're a sinner, the penalty of sin is death because that's how holy God is that any amount of sin requires death. And it's not just physical death, it's, it's spiritual death. Like we're, we're born spiritually dead, spiritually turned off to our creator. And not just spiritual death, but there's physical death. Like we understand that, we, that's a reality for everyone. One day we're going to die. And then it's not just physical death, it's eternal death. Like eternal separation from God the God who loves you and made you, you will be eternally separated from him, paying the price for the sin that is inside of you and the sin that you continue to choose. That's really, really bad. 
That, that sounds like a situation that, that I cannot overcome. That, that sounds like the Israelites standing there in the valley like, I have no plan for this enemy that, like, I know I can't take, I, I cannot fight Goliath. I'm looking around, like, these guys cannot fight Goliath either. We're done. We're, we're like, paralyzed with fear because of this huge enemy that's in front of us. But the story doesn't end there, right? Let's zoom back in on our episode. Let's zoom back in on David and Goliath. Number two, David cuts off the enemy's head. Now, I'll give you, I'll give you another insight into student ministry. Whenever, whenever like, I'm preparing to teach a message to students, especially out of the Old Testament, like, there is some stuff in the Old Testament that is R-rated completely. And there's stuff that if, like, you, you wouldn't want your kids watching that on TV, but they can go read it in the Bible, so you got to learn how to deal with that. But, like, but you can read through some of this stuff in the Old Testament, and it's intense. And so if I was teaching on David and Goliath, I might just, like, stop before, like, David runs over and gets out his sword and saws off Goliath's head and holds it up. Like, whoa, <laughs> chill. I might just be like, oh, you know, David, he... He hits him with a slingshot and he falls into a deep sleep. Like, I might just censor it a little bit. But here's the deal. Like, I, I, think that, I think that that is in there for a reason. Again, because I think God's teaching us more than just what we see in this episode. So in the story, David goes out as a savior. Like this, he, he's not, it's not even his battle. Like he walks out into the valley he, he, it's not even his battle. He's not a soldier. He's kind of like them because he's an Israelite, but he's not a soldier. Like he, he shouldn't be accepting that burden by walking out onto that battlefield. And as we zoom out, let's look, let's look at the gospel. Like the Bible says that Jesus, God in the flesh, like a Savior is sent for us. Just like a Savior is sent for the Israelites in this story, a Savior is sent for us when we have no hope in our sin. And I think it's important that David cuts off Goliath's head. Because when Jesus goes on the cross, it's like when David walked out into that valley. Like, he, that wasn't his fight to fight. That wasn't his burden. And yeah, Jesus is kind of like us because he's a man. But he, he's really different than us too because he's totally God also. And so when Jesus goes to the cross, what happens is he, he takes all of my sin. Like, all of it. The sin that I'm born with, that I choose, that I will choose. And he puts it on himself. Because we know that the penalty for sin is death, right? Three kinds of death. But what Jesus does is through, he lives this perfect life, goes to the cross, absorbs all of my sin, takes it, and pays for it. And he dies on that cross. But he doesn't stay dead, right? Three days later, he rises again. Because three days later, when he rises again... He shows us that, hey, he's, he's more powerful than sin. He's more powerful than death. Actually, he cut the head off of it because he rose again victorious, living after death tried to swallow him, right? Our Savior is more powerful than sin and death. He cuts the head off of it. And like we've been saying through this whole series, this isn't like one story. You can go all the way back to Genesis, the first book in the Bible. In the third chapter, God's talking to Satan and he issues him this warning. It's like the first prophecy, the first prophecy about the coming Messiah, and he says, look, he's, this Savior, this Messiah, he's going to deliver a head wound to sin and death. He's going to deliver a head wound. So that's in the very first book of the Bible. Fast forward to, to David and Goliath. This Savior figure comes in, takes on this enemy, cuts his head off. Fast forward to Jesus. This Savior figure comes, who's the, the hero of the whole story, takes on sin and death, and cuts his head off. Like, that's the gospel, and we're not David. We're not. We're the Israelites who were scared and who were stuck and had no option. And this, like, dude came in out of nowhere and rescued us. And we totally reap the benefit of our Savior who comes in and saves us. Number three, the Israelites advance. I think it's important to look at, like, after this enemy is taken down... The Israelites advance because of David's victory. And only because of David's victory. Like, the enemy, the enemy sees this. They see that, that Goliath is taken down, and they take off running. And look at what 
this next verse says, uh, verse 51, it says this, And all the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout and pursued the Philistines. David's victory changed everything for them. It caused them to rise and to run. Okay, and so we, we said, like, this isn't Star Wars. This isn't something that we're not involved in. This is the point where you and I are invited into God's story. We are the Israelites who get saved and then get sent out. Because the gospel says that God sees us in our sin. He sees our sin problem that we have no way to fix. Through Jesus, he conquers sin and death. And then after that, he offers us life. He offers us life in himself through that transaction that takes place on the cross. Because we said Jesus lived a perfect life. I've not lived a perfect life. I've lived a very unperfect life. But when my sin is put on Jesus, his perfection is put back on me. I totally benefit from having done nothing but been saved by a God who loves me. That's the transaction that takes place on the cross. So just to kind of quickly recap our three points before we go into our last section. David rescues the Israelites from an unwinnable battle. Number two, he cuts the head off of the enemy. And number three, as a result, the Israelites advance because of David's victory. Now, the, the whole kind of idea of this story is that you've got to know your role in it. You've got to know your role because your role is not to come in and be the Savior. That's not your role in the gospel. And I am, like, historically bad at knowing my role in things. So I'll just tell you guys, I come from a very big family. I have five brothers and sisters, and we're all huge. Like, like we're, all, we're just a herd of Goliaths in and of ourselves. Like, I have three sisters. They're all six feet tall. My, my little sister is playing volleyball at LSU. My brother's 6'5". I'm 6'6", six, six, which is like, that's just an important truth that I feel like needs to be out there. I try to remind him of that. Like, he's my older brother, but, hey, it's true. Like, it's just truth. we got to meditate on it, that he's 6'5". And I'm 6'6". Six, six. Um, but, like, we're, we're, we're big, so we're, like, always a sports family. Okay? And, and, and usually being big is great. It really helps out. When I play basketball, it super helps that I'm a giant. I'm not going to lie. Um, but when I, was, when I was a kid, like, I got signed up to play Little League Baseball. And so part of being the big kid is, like, you're probably not the fast kid. <laughs> Just true. So I was the big, I was the big, slightly chubby, uh, like kid that could that could hit the baseball because I guess I had a lot of practice with my lightsabers. Like I was good at that. Uh, so I could hit the ball, but but the act of running around the bases didn't come so easy to me. So I get a hit, um, and I'm standing on second base. And my my teammate gets up. They get a hit, and so I take off running at what feels like an incredible rate, and it was not. But I'm, I'm running toward third base, and I have my two coaches standing behind third base, and their job is to either be like, you know, you've got time, go home, send me home, or, or you can't do it, like, the like, ball's coming back, stay at third. And so I'm running, slash waddling, like, toward, toward third base, and I just feel amazing. Like, this is my moment. I'm so fast. I don't know if you've ever, like, seen yourself on video and been like, that's what I look like? That's awful. <laughs> but I'm, I'm running toward third base, and my, my two coaches didn't even think about it. They're like, whoa, pump the brakes, Tubby. Like, stay at third. <laughs> and, I, and I just said, no, this is my moment. Like, I want to be fast so bad, I'm going to be fast. And so I round third, and I take, and I, I head home. And some memories, like, some little stupid memories just get lodged in your brain. This is one of them. I was like 10 years old. But I take off, and I hear my two coaches. The one looks at the other, and he goes, man that kid's got one speed. <laughs> and I was like, what? One speed? What are you talking about? I'm flying. And I got thrown out, of course, at home, um, and it was fine. But I learned a lesson. Like, it was not my role to be the, the kid stealing bases on that team. I'll hit it. Like, I'll go hit it and send a fast kid to go run. But, like, I didn't know my role on that team. And when I tried to play a different role, it, it didn't really work out for anybody. And so as we talk about, like, our role in the gospel, our role in this story, you, you've got to know what it is. Because the last section we're going to go into is kind of like, what, what does a life 
connected to Jesus actually look like? What, what does that mean? But, but the reality is, like, it's really hard to see what that means if you are trying to play Jesus' role. It's really hard to see what a whole life connected and in love with Jesus looks like if you're trying to play his role. Or if you're looking to someone else to play his role. Or something else to play his role. Something else to give you satisfaction or to give you hope or to give you peace or something to live for or like a purpose. Like that is Jesus' role. And we get it so mixed up because we throw ourselves in there and we try to make ourselves great. Or we put an, a goal or a person or a relationship or like anything that we think will give us hope in life. Like we'll, we'll put it there and we'll live for it. But that's Jesus' role. That God made you for Christ to be in that role. But we easily forget that. See, we kind of like, we kind of like, I think of our lives as movies and we have to be the main character and I better make a good movie like because I get one shot at this. But that's not our role. We're not the main character. We're the Israelites. We're, we were scared and stuck in our circumstance. We are scared and stuck in sin because in ourselves, we have no way to overcome it. We're saved. We're rescued out of that circumstance by this Savior who comes out of nowhere and then we're sent out. So playing your part in the gospel, playing your part in God's bigger story, it looks like this. It looks like what the Israelites did. They were freed, and then they were sent out on mission. The gospel results in freedom and mission. See, when I'm, I'm free to play the part that God made me to play, and that's bringing about like his kingdom in the world, I'm freed from the bondage and sin that used to like hold me down and that problem of sin, that thing that I couldn't conquer. I'm freed from that. I'm freed from searching for my identity. I'm freed from searching for my purpose or my significance or why am I here or does anybody love me? Like I'm freed from all of that through the gospel because I know who loves me. It's a savior who came out of nowhere to save me. That's what the gospel says. I'm a sinner who is saved and loved. But see, we, we all have put things in that Savior role. We've all done it. And, it. and it can satisfy for a second. It might, it might feel good for a minute. But ultimately, like, it, it leads us right back to our sin. Nothing satisfies in the way that the Savior, who you were made for, satisfies. And so as we talk about, like, the freedom of the gospel, it's not just freedom from sin. It's actually freedom to something, freedom to a Savior. See, I, I love how Casey, Casey always says, like, I think that God is a, a, actually a loving Father who, who loves you more than you know and wants to give you more and more of himself. And so as I walk with God and I, and I have the Spirit inside of me, like, I fall more and more in love with him, and that's... That's my purpose, is to, is to just enjoy my Savior and then to live my life on mission as a result. So the second, God, the gospel puts us on mission. And what's that mission? What's our purpose? It's to bring about God's kingdom. It's to, it's to help play out his story. Like we get to play a part in what God's been doing ever since creation. The, the New Testament says that God makes us his ambassadors. Like when you understand the gospel and, and you're engaged with Jesus, you are an ambassador of God playing out his story and a soldier in his army for the world who needs the gospel. Like that's, that's, a, pretty good, that's a pretty good purpose. That's a better purpose than anything that I could come up with because God has put you and he's made you in a way that you can take the gospel to places that only you can. He's given you relationships He's put you in your work for a purpose. He's put the people around you and your family there for a reason. See, it's, it's not about like getting up on a stage and preaching the gospel. That's, you look, you look at, at Christian history, that's not how the gospel spreads. The gospel spreads by, by like the soldiers in the army going out into the world where they already are in their relationships and bringing about his kingdom. It's an amazing story. 
But here's the deal. Like, I'll, I am so, so quick to forget that. So quick. Like, I will, I will walk out of here and today I will forget who I am and I'll begin to live for other things because I'm, I'm just an Israelite, right? Like, I'm just a sinner. Every single one of us, as like hyped up as we can get at times, we can just like that forget it and begin to live just like everybody else. Because you're not a soldier that's, that's, that's made to go out on your own and like do this thing. The, arm, the, the, the Israelites go out together. We're sent out as an army because we're not very good soldiers, so they need a lot of us. Like we're, we're quick to forget. As, I, as I'm... As I'm preparing to share this message, like, I was so nervous this morning. Like, <laughs> I was, because I'm all wrapped up, and what will people like it, and what will people think of me, and I, like, I hope I do well, and like, I'm just functionally showing so much that I, that I am so worried about myself that I need people reminding me, like, dude, it does not matter if you fall off the stage. <laughs> like, this is about the Holy Spirit and how great he is, not how great you are. My phone has been blowing up last night and this morning with people texting me, encouraging me, we're praying for you. Like, remember, it's not about you, man. It's just about, it's about bringing glory to Jesus. Like, I need that. I need people around me constantly on my team, like, encouraging me. We all do. That's what the church is. Like, we're, we're running, bringing about God's purpose together on mission. So as the, the band comes out, I just want to end with a, with a few thoughts, a couple questions. Do you, do you know your role, like, in the gospel? Are, are, you, are you trying to be your own savior, have someone else as your savior? H have you experienced the freedom that is found in Jesus? Because if you haven't experienced that freedom and that release of, like, this sin and burden that's off of you and get to enjoy a savior... If you haven't experienced that, then that's where we got to start. Because you get freed from having to be your own savior, having to, to look to something or someone else to give you purpose. And if you haven't experienced that, then, then what's stopping you this morning from experiencing that? Because we believe that God has each and every one of you here for a reason, that he sees your sin, like that, that thing that you might think, there's no way that God would love me if he saw this. Or, or he, God, there's no way God could forgive me from that. God, God created you, and he knows you deeply. He knows you more than you know yourself, and he still says, come to me. I love you. I know you're just an Israelite. You don't have to save yourself. I saved you already from my glory, so come to him. The second question is this. If, if you've experienced that freedom in Christ, are you on mission with his army? Are you on mission? Because you can be on mission without his army. And we've talked about why that doesn't work. We, we need our brothers and sisters around us reminding us, preaching the gospel to us. And you can also be in the army and not really be on mission. You can be really good at coming to church and singing the songs and listening to the Christian music on the radio, but are you bringing the gospel to bear in the relationships and the places that God has put you? Because you're an ambassador for the king, like you're a representative and he's called you to that because he loves you. And so if we learned last week that Saul, the story of Saul points us to a better king, then this week, as we look at the story of David and Goliath, David just points us to a better savior. That's all, that's all he does, is he points us to a savior. So should you have faith like David? Yeah. Is God bigger than your circumstances? Yeah. But you're just an Israelite, and you need to come to the savior who came into your circumstance and saved you and loves you. So let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you saved us. Thank you that you came into our, our broken situation that in and of ourselves we have no way to overcome. And we constantly fail and we might feel inadequate, God, but that's what makes you greater. 
So Lord, would you be with us now as we spend some time in worship? God, would you engage with us this morning? Remind us of the gospel. Remind us that we don't have to be the savior. Send us out on mission for your glory, God. Amen.